So I invite you to take your Bibles and turn there to 2 Kings 18. And as we hear the Word of God, as we come to hear the Word of God read and proclaimed, let us take a moment to ask His blessing. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you that we can gather once more at your call and by your mercy and grace. And we come again to hear your word, to submit ourselves to it, to learn from it, and to be encouraged and built up by it. Lord, all of this you are able to do by your spirit, working with, it, with the word in our hearts. And so we would ask that you would do that this night as it is read, and especially as it is proclaimed, that you might be glorified in our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 18, this is the word of the living God. Let us give our attention to its reading. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called the Hushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him wherever he went out. He prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. In the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years, he took it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. The king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria and put them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant. Even all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, they neither listened nor obeyed. In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria, Elakish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, three hundred talents of silver and thirty talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorpost that Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they arrived, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway to the washer's field. And when they called for the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it, such as Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. How well, then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. 
Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and to drink their own urine? Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me, and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine, and each one of his own fig tree, and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Harma and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharphaim, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But the people were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. The grass withers. And the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Brothers and sisters, as we continue our study tonight of Second Kings, remember where we're at. Uh, we took last week off for our hymn sing. The northern kingdom of Israel has fallen in chapter 17. They have been taken away into exile. There were some among them who believed that such a day would never come that they could trust in God for some help at some point. For how can God cast off his inheritance? He had called Israel to himself to be his people, and he promised to be their God. God had declared further that he is the faithful God. All other gods may leave, but he will not. In some ways, the exile can be a challenge to the promise in our minds. If God would be with them, where, where he, if God would, would not be with them, or if he was, sorry, if God was to be with them, where was he when Assyria conquered Samaria? This is where we remember that apostasy is a real thing, turning away from God. It is a danger warned against in both the Old and the New Testaments. In Leviticus 26, verses 21 to 28, we have this very thing that was told to the people of Israel. And then if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will continue striking you sevenfold for your sins. And I will let loose the wild beasts against you, which shall bereave you of your children and destroy your livestock and make you few in number, so that your roads shall be deserted. And if by this discipline you are not turned to me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you. And I myself will strike you sevenfold for your sins, and I will bring a sword upon you that shall execute vengeance for the covenant." And if you gather within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I break your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in a single oven, and shall dole out your bread again by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. But if in spite of this you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins." Israel was warned over and over and over again from the very beginning and all the way through. Moreover, in the New Testament, Jesus tells the story of a sower going out to sow some seed. And he speaks of the seed that falls on the rocky ground. It springs up, but since it does not have depth of soil, the sun rose and scorched it. And since they had no root, they withered away. Jesus explains that parable and he says, As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately 
falls away. We've been reminded throughout our study then of Samuel and Kings that mere outward acceptance of God is not trusting in the Lord. Israel, that is the northern kingdom, had shown time after time that they were ready to depart from the Lord. Even when the Lord showed covenant faithfulness and steadfast love, they rebelled and rejected him. For 265 years, they rebelled and rejected him. And so God was faithful to his word, to his promise of exile. We saw this last time, and yet we also saw how this wasn't the end, even of the northern kingdom. It is true that the Lord would come in judgment, but he would not be angry forever. Not only would there be a remnant who was cared for through the exile, we also saw how the Samaritans were woven back into the story in Christ in Acts chapter 8. Indeed, this is even a promise that is given to many other nations that are condemned in in the Old Testament. In Jeremiah 48, God speaks against Moab, but then says, Yet I will restore the fortunes of Moab in the latter days. We are reminded that the story of redemptive history is long and complicated, and that we are not in charge of it. There are hard parts to the story, and maybe even lots of hard parts, but it is not our story. It is God's. It is ours to hear it and to honor the one who worked redemption even in the midst of such a sinful people. For that is where we place our hope, in God and his faithfulness to his word, not in our faithfulness. Well, as we come to 2 Kings 18, we we sort of turn a corner, a bright spot in the history of the kings to this point. Hezekiah. He he was the son of a terrible and wicked father, a wicked king, Ahaz. And his own son will be one of the most wicked kings of Judah, Manasseh. But Hezekiah walked according to God's word, and as we'll see, yet his reign is not marked by perfect peace. We are surprised to see him being threatened by the king of Assyria the very same way that Hosea, the king of Israel, had been threatened. Hezekiah had done the right things, it seems, and yet it did not equal a peaceful reign. What's going on here? Where is God in all of this? The truth is, is that God is still right there with Hezekiah as he is being tested and tried. Indeed, God allows his people to pass through certain experiences so that he may see and prove to them that their faith in him is genuine. We don't like it. We can understand it when things go wrong, when we've done wrong. But an important lesson about faith is that we are called to trust the Lord regardless of our circumstances. Indeed, trust is the theme of this chapter. It's repeated eight times. You'll notice it's repeated in the mouth of the enemy of Hezekiah, in the mouth of the Rabshakeh. Trusting in God in the midst of trial. Trusting in God when faith is tested. This is what we need to see tonight. As Solomon writes in Proverbs 29, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. So let's think this evening together about Hezekiah's trust. We get the statement of it in the very beginning. We're told that Hezekiah becomes king when he is 25 years old. Someone mentioned, I think it was the last time when we were together, about Ahaz and when he had died at 36. Would that mean that uh, Hezekiah was born when Ahaz was a mere 11 years old? Well, I wrestled with that just a little bit this week, thinking about it and looking and comparing uh, the various ages. And interestingly, throughout history, commentators have taken a, a very different approach to this. Older commentators just simply state it. He was 11. Move on. Newer commentators try to give a little bit more of a nuance, recognizing that uh, um, fathering a child at 11, um, uh, while not biologically impossible, uh, might be a bit um, um, just odd to our ears. And so one writes this, that Hezekiah had now entered the 25th year, and he might be just turned 24, the way that they count years. He was in his 25th year. And so his father might be 12 years of age at his birth, or as is usual for the divine historian to take away or to add the incomplete years of kings, Ahaz might have been near 21 when he began to reign, and he might have reigned almost 17 years, though still 16. 
which makes the age of Ahaz to be about 38, and Hezekiah being but a little more than 24 at his death, so maybe 13 or 14 years. Well, I don't know if that takes away uh, 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 what some would describe as the ick factor there. Uh, but nevertheless, there is uh, a possible answer, although I don't think that we're meant to get bogged down in those numbers. What we are supposed to see in this text is Hezekiah's reign and his life as king. And what kind of life did he have? What kind of reign did he have? The summary is given to us there in verse 3. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David, his father, had done. Indeed, the worship of the Lord was at the foremost of Hezekiah's mind. We're given the specifics in verse 4. He waged war against idolatry in the land, and he rooted it out. Even the most righteous of the Judean kings thus far, as we have seen, have failed to act against those, those, those shrines, have failed to act uh, uh, against the, uh, the high places and the pillars, and even at times the Asherah, that had been erected. Indeed, the recurrent complaint has been that the high places were not removed. But here Hezekiah removes them. And look what he does further. It was even when he found, uh, 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 um, or when he found that the, the bronze serpent was being misused, he tore that down. Remember the bronze serpent? It's in Numbers 21 when, when the serpents stro struck the people of Israel and they called out to the Lord. The bronze serpent was lifted up and when they looked in faith, trusting in God's promises, they were healed. What as is the tendency of man to take a good thing and to turn it even into an idolatrous thing, they had set it up and they had begun to make offerings to it. This is, of course, something that is recurrent throughout church history. As the Reformers themselves pointed out, when looking at Numbers 21 and looking specifically at this passage, it is also something that we find in the Romanists, who take something that is good and given to us, such as the Lord's Supper, and bow down before it. Just like the bronze serpent that Israel had bowed down before. Hezekiah, for his part, was, was zealous for the worship of God. Indeed, his restoration of worship was extensive. It's not given to us here in 2 Kings, but in 2 Chronicles, there are three whole chapters dedicated to Hezekiah's restoration of worship. In 2 Chronicles 29, he restores the temple. In chapter 30, he reinstitutes the Passover. And in chapter 31, he reestablishes the priests. All of this Hezekiah is zealous to do. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Further, he trusted in God. We see his dependence. In verse 5, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. He trusted in the Lord. He clung to the Lord, we are told. We are told that he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him. Now this is the summary which sets us up for what is to come. The summary of his life is that he trusted in the Lord, which means that what we're going to wrestle with in this chapter is when his trust in the Lord is challenged. And it is true that we see, and we'll see in a moment, that he does stumble, but he would not depart. Moreover, we are told that the Lord was with him. He refused to serve the king of Assyria, which will set up again what follows. And he is the first king since David to strike down the Philistines. Hezekiah was a good king. He was a faithful king. He honored the Lord. And given all of this, you would think that the things would go well for Hezekiah, that he wouldn't find his faith being challenged in ways that were identical, not just to his wicked father Ahaz, but to the wicked kingdom of Israel. And yet, that's exactly what we see. His trust in God is challenged. It is tested. Indeed, we can begin in verse 9 to see the very first challenge to his faith. It's in verses 9 to 12. And it just sort of recaps what had taken place in the previous chapter. It recaps the fact that Israel, the northern kingdom, had been taken away into Israel by another king of Assyria, Shalmaneser, who came up against Samaria and besieged it. For three years, he cut off all supplies until the people were finally able to be taken away, captivity, into captivity. 
the context then is that he sees what God allows to happen to his neighbor, to Israel. Moreover, we were told in 2 Kings 17 and verse 19 that Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs that Israel had introduced. Given that context, you can imagine this moment as, as Assyria is besieging it or is preparing to besiege Jerusalem. The thought in Hezekiah's mind would surely be if God would let Israel fall, will he let us fall as well? Indeed, we see the slipping of his faith there in verse 13 and following. What does he do? He, he, he is, he is uh, uh, um, confronted. Uh, um, uh, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And so what does Hezekiah do? He says, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. It's a little more intense in the Hebrew. He says, I have sinned. He repents to the king of Assyria. He's doing everything he can in order to keep the king of Assyria from coming against him. And in fact, he does it all in his own strength, doesn't he? He strips down the temple, as all the other kings had done, to pay him off. Surely this is not a very promising beginning to the conflict. It seems that Hezekiah may indeed be about to suffer the same fate as Hoshea, the king of Israel, regardless of the trust in the Lord that is spoken in the opening of our chapter. For all that Hezekiah has been lauded as a king, quite unlike anyone who preceded him, his first reaction to a foreign attack is a familiar one. Indeed, he is confronted by, uh, by the Reb Shekha there in, in verse 20. Just skip down a little bit. Uh, um, uh, as to whether or not he's trusting in Egypt. Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff. And we get no information that Hezekiah had indeed turned to Egypt for help. It seems rather that, that the Rabshakeh is bringing up something from the past and sort of mocking Hezekiah in this way, telling him that he is he, that, that, that he's putting his trust in the wrong place because he is trusting in perhaps himself or in Egypt. Here we see Hezekiah in a way that we can certainly relate to him because it is true that in the past Judah had relied upon Egypt. Indeed, even Israel, the northern kingdom, had tried to rely upon Egypt. Past sins are always something that seem to come into our minds or to be brought to our attention by others. I do love how Luther dealt with this. Martin Luther, when he speaks of sort of the, the past sins haunting us or the past sins being brought to our attention, he says, so when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he, uh, and where he is, there I shall be also. Satan, you will not prevail against me when you try to terrify me by setting forth the greatness of my sins and try to bring me into heaviness, distrust, despair, hatred, contempt, and blasphemy against God. On the contrary, when you say I am a sinner, you give me armor and weapons against yourself so that with your own sword I may cut your throat and tread you under my feet. For Christ died for sinners." Well, that's all well and good, of course. Luther would have told Hezekiah to not allow those past sins to be thrown into his face. But here is Hezekiah in the midst of temptation. That is the temptation to distrust God, to question God. And the Rab Sheka is sent along with the Tartan and the Rab Saris. These, these three sort of officials from Assyria are sent with a great army there to the doors of Jerusalem to go to King Hezekiah. And we are told that as they do, they come ready to challenge his trust in God. I do want us to note the location though. Look there at verse 17. It says, when they arrived, toward the end of verse 17, when they arrived, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway to the washer's field. This is actually a familiar location. It's the very same place that Ahaz was met by Isaiah when Isaiah told him the sign 
that would be the promise of God's faithfulness. Remember that there Ahaz's faith was tested and he crumbled. He crumbled. I will not put the Lord to the test, he says, pretending piety. Hezekiah is met at the same spot, not by the prophet Isaiah, but by the Rabshakeh, the Rabsaris, and the Tartan. How will he fare? We see, of course, that the Rabshakeh goes on to, to challenge him. There in verse 19, Say to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, on what do you rest this trust of yours? On what do you rest this trust of yours? Well, we've already dealt with the, the accusation about Egypt, but let's move on and look at verse 22. He says, if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed? This is an argument designed to sow seeds of doubt. From the very start, in the temptation of the test against Hezekiah, the Rabshakeh is trying to divide the people from the Davidic king. If they can get the people, if he can get the people to turn on the king, then the king will be forced to give up. Well, look at the way that he tries it. It is undoubtedly true that the high places were throughout much of the preceding period places where worship had taken place, but not necessarily always worship of the Lord. For God was not satisfied with them. And they were constantly a snare to God's people. Hezekiah had done the right thing. But even that was being thrown into his face and making him look weak. I was reminded of Augustine's city of God and those who argued that Rome was going to fall because they had abandoned their pantheon of gods for the Christian faith. Hezekiah, in the midst of this trial, in the midst of this struggle, would certainly feel the sting of the Rabshakeh's words as he challenges him not to trust in the Lord. He further goes on to say that, 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 that Sennacherib is really doing the will of God. First he mocks him there in verse 23, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you're able on your part to set riders on them. I'll even give you a head start, he says. I'll give you all the horses you need and then watch you fall. Indeed, the fact that they cannot do that, he says, how then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants? They would send in the backup of the backup of the backup. And even then, he says that Jerusalem would fall. Look at verse 25. This is the challenge. Is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. It is true that the Lord had used the Assyrians, to bring judgment upon his people in, in, in chapter 17 we saw and in chapter 18 in verses 9 to 12. Is it true what he's saying? Is he on a mission from God to come against Jerusalem? Surely Hezekiah would find himself wondering. Of course it's not true. It's a test of his faith. A test of his faith as to whether or not he ought to trust the Lord. We see, of course, the Rabshakeh won't even, won't even listen to the request that is made by Eliakim and Shebna and Joah there in verse 26. Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. You no, know, the desire is to drive a wedge between the faithful son of David and the people of Jerusalem, the people of Judah. He challenges him as to what's going to happen, what's going to be left for them. And he says, has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you and not to the men sitting on the wall? That is the elders who would be there to hear everything that was talked, uh, spoken. He says, who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and to drink their own urine. This was the purpose of the besieging of a city, to cut off any supply. They couldn't bring in produce. They couldn't get fresh water. They would cut off the water and the people would become desperate so desperate that they would oftentimes open the gates. But then further, the Rabshakeh continues in verse 28, and he declares that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, is greater than God. Perhaps this is where he goes too far. Perhaps he had the, the, the attention of the peoples with the threat of what they would eat and what they would drink. But now he says, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Israel. 
Well, throughout the scriptures, God is the one who is described as the great king. In Psalm 47, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the most high, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Psalm 95, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Sennacherib begins to take the place in his pride of God himself. Well, Hezekiah is being described as the one who is the tempter. Notice how the enemy is swapping the roles. It is Sennacherib, it is the Rabshakeh who is the tempter. But instead, he says in verse 29, thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, the Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given to the hand of the king of Assyria. Indeed, the word that's used here for deceive is the same word that, that is used to describe what Satan did in the garden. And the tactic is the same, questioning God's goodness, questioning God's love, indeed, even questioning God's authority. Continuing, of course, to, to usurp the place of God, the Rabshakeh goes on in verse 31 with a false promise. He says, Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of his own fig tree. And each one of you will drink the water of his own sister. And having told them what they would eat in the besieging of the city, now he offers them this blessing, a vine, a fig tree, water from his own cistern. Indeed, he says, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. Oh, he makes the exile sound so appealing. Perhaps it'll be better for them to go away into exile. What's more is these are the very same things that God had promised to his people. He had promised them grain, wine, bread, vineyards, olive trees, honey, the fig tree, all of it. It is the promised land. Deuteronomy 8, verses 7 to 10, we read, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Essentially, the king of, uh, of Assyria is tempting them with everything that God had promised them. But if he would only do it his, if they would only do it his way. He reminds us, of course, of that third temptation of our Savior, Jesus Christ. When the devil takes him to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he says, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. All Hezekiah had to do, all the people of Jerusalem had to do, is to submit themselves to the king of Assyria, to Sennacherib. He is, after all, the great king. He goes on and he gives a direct challenge to God's power. The end of verse 32, we read, And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Not only has he usurped the place of God, but now he, he, he challenges God. He challenges God. Indeed, we see that this is true as we turn to the next chapter in 2 Kings 19 in verses 5 and 6 when Isaiah sends to Hezekiah and says to him, Thus says the Lord, do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. And yet, in our chapter, God seems silent. He seems far off. The army of Assyria is near and threatening the voice of the Rabshakeh is what is heard in the ears of the people and in the ears of Hezekiah. What can he do? Well, he can do the only thing that he does. He trusts in the Lord. Indeed, he trusts in God and he continues to wait upon God. As Richard Sibbs puts it, cast yourself into the arms of Christ and if you perish, perish there. If you do not, you are sure to perish. 
If mercy is to be found anywhere, it is there. Hezekiah, remember the summary, is a good king. He trusts in the Lord. And yet, this is only shown to us now in the silence that follows. Verse 36, the people were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, do not answer him. Amazingly, the Rabshakeh's plan failed. The people did not rise up against Hezekiah to force him to surrender. They followed the king's command, and the officials mourned. They came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. Silence at the end. Now, of course, that's because there's silence, because there's more to come. 2 Kings 19 and 2 Kings 20 will continue the life of Hezekiah. And particularly, 2 Kings 19, we will get the, salute, the, the, the outcome, the conclusion of this story. The division between the chapters is interesting. Maybe it's because the text would just be too long, and so they divided it. Those who are aware of how the Old Testament was written, it was the Hebrews themselves that would, that would divide the chapters. So maybe that's why they just divided it. Or maybe, as Scripture was read week after week, God's people are called to sit with the question of trusting in God when all things point in the other direction. In other words, if there was just a quick solution, it was just over, done, everything worked out perfectly, maybe we would be tempted to wonder why that's not the case in our lives. You know, the scriptures leave us sitting, perhaps uncomfortably, waiting for God's response. Silence, because there's more to come. The silence, because it's also the right response. This is what we find throughout the scripture. Jeremiah 11, verses 18 and 19, we read, The Lord made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds, but I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not know it was against me they devised schemes. Jeremiah, the prophet, experienced opposition and betrayal. How does he respond? He is silent. He submits to the Lord. He trusts in God. Psalm 38, verses 12 to 14, we read, Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man. I do not hear. Like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear and whose mouth are no rebukes. David in this psalm expresses his experience of false accusations and his response is silence. The imagery of being like a mute man who does not open his mouth echoes the theme of silence before his accusers. Well, surely we know where this goes. Not every accusation needs an answer. No. To trust in God is to wait on Him. Perhaps shown most clearly in the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53 and verse 7, we read, He was oppressed and He was afflicted, yet He opened not His mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So He opened not His mouth. Even there on the cross as He hung, and He was mocked by others, who said he saved him. others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let, him deliver him. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. Indeed, what Hezekiah would face is what Christ would face upon the cross. Would Hezekiah trust in God? Christ, as we know, entrusted himself to the one who had sent him. And here is where we end our study. And again, it's kind of an awkward ending because it's not quite the end of the story. But this is our hope. Psalm 25, which we sang, says, Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. This is our confession. Some will ask whether it is true. We believe it and confess it. Though our story here in 2 Kings 18 ends as a cliffhanger, will God allow Hezekiah to be humiliated? Will God allow Jerusalem to be destroyed? He had given Samaria over to the king of Assyria, 
would he give Jerusalem to the king of Assyria? As we continue our study then together, we'll see that all those who wait on the Lord, that those who trust in the Lord, will not be put to shame. 